Well, all right. Good morning, everybody. My name is John. I'm back again today to talk to y'all about some of the trending articles in the crypto news space. Got an interesting little episode for you today. But first off, thanks to all those who have subscribed. It really does mean a lot to me. I enjoy doing this for you and for me. Uh, it's a great chance to learn a bit more about the industry. And as always, everything I talk about can be found in a link or links down in the description so you can read these articles for yourselves. So you don't have to just listen to what I say. You can do uh, your own legwork because that's the most important part. I'm just some dude in his basement. You shouldn't take anything I say as anything you should actually do. So first up today, we got to talk about good old swipe. Though you guys don't know, it has been pretty volatile the past week. So Swipe's Swipe Token, or SXP, is the 68th digital asset by market cap. It has been one of the most volatile cryptos of the previous weeks. Definitely has. Uh, fueled by a new crypto card that launched in partnership with Binance. Binance actually bought out Swipe, if I remember correctly. XXP price soared from a buck fifty to five dollars in a matter of days throughout august however the price of swipe just dropped by about 50 percent back to 250. that's the same thing we just saw with Chainlink. when you have a meteoric rise like that you are gonna find some pullback i wouldn't uh completely freak out just yet so when swipe retraced back to this level of support it did bounce 35% since. However, a clear breakout new rally toward the new all-time high seems unlikely in the short term. We're probably going to be looking at a pretty long period of consolidation according to these TA guys. But of course, as we all know, who knows in the crypto space, but uh, odds are it's going to be sitting kind of meh for a while. Uh, for the swipe token to rise further, it has to break out from its current resistance level, which can be found between $3.10 and $3.20. However, once swipe breaks out of this range, a new uh, impulse wave is likely, given the current market momentum and sentiment surrounding the project. Uh, yeah, partnership with Binance is pretty lucrative, especially the way they're doing. Um, a lot of people are saying they're expecting 660 to 670, possibly all the way up to $9.40. But we will see. It's got to do some pretty crazy stuff for that to happen, in my opinion. But with Binance helping them out, you never really know. I do like Swipe. Don't own any Swipe. Just got to throw that out there. But uh, it looks like it's going to be kind of rocking back and forth for a while. Market-wise, it's not the greatest. We got another red day that we'll talk about later. So just kind of a meh. Everyone still seems to be in waiting mode as a result of good old corona and the quarantine. Uh, we're in a bit of a slump in the just all the global markets right now because of it. And we'll see where it continues. But hey, let's hop on over and talk about Yearn. So Wi-Fi or Yearn Finance is one of the cheapest DeFi tokens by price to sales, according to Masari, despite the fact that it's like $13,000 right now. So how'd they decide that this was the number? So Masari believes that Yearn Finance's token is one of the least expensive in the DeFi space, according to its price to sales multiple. This metric is calculated by dividing a token's market cap by its annualized yield. In Wi-Fi's case, its capitalization at the time of calculation was $390 million. According to Masari, its annualized sales started at $21 million. So by dividing the two numbers, we get approximately 20x. For reference, the same ratio for CRV, which is another popular DeFi token, is 1,568 times, making it 78 times more expensive according to this ratio that the Masari seemingly has pulled out of the butt. I, I, I kid. Um, pretty interesting that that's how they're using things to, to calculate. Um, if that's an accurate calculation, then we could see some uptick in the Wi-Fi price. Uh, there's not a lot of Wi-Fi floating around so it does make sense that the token would be pretty expensive uh, masari also noted that unlike many of its competitors yield dot finance does not currently have any significant expenses essentially turning its price to sales ratio into price to earnings uh, and it should be noted at the current price of thirteen thousand three hundred dollars at the time this article is written wi-fi is worth more than 15 percent more than bitcoin so 
Uh, we've been talking about Wi-Fi a lot. This is the one where the guy was like, oh yeah, I made this so it could be decentralized. Oh, it's worthless. Don't even bother. We're not going to list it on any exchanges. And then before you know it, it's $13,000. And it is one of the most talked about coins in the DeFi space. Talk about weird. But hey, that's crypto, baby. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, this might be something that prompts you to maybe want to get into Wi-Fi tokens just because of this graph right here. I would do a bit more research. Uh, Masari is a pretty reputable name in the space, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't base a $13,000 purchase if you want to buy a whole Wi-Fi based off of something one website tells you. But to continue on with uh, <laughs> DeFi today, uh, Ave. Yeah, we got to talk about Ave. So the total value locked has increased by 170% to more than 1.3 billion in August for the token. Uh, the lending protocol has recently added new features like credit delegation uh, with more in the works. And Ave's lend token price is up more than 3,900% so far this year. Uh, yeah, so the total value locked or TVL. The increase coincides with a rise in price. The Lend token valued at just over 30 cents at the start of August is currently trading for 69 cents. Nice. So the growth may suggest that the DeFi protocols don't need liquidity mining, a feature that Aave has yet to roll out, but they're working on it to attract value and pump up protocol token prices. Uh, innovation is relevant too. So Aave has been around. Ooh, boys, they launched in 2020, but... Uh, after evolving from ETH Lend, which came around in 2017 with an ICO of 18 million. So it's been around in one form or another for a few years now. So Aave has become a leading platform for a variety of DeFi offerings, including fixed and variable rate crypto loans and flash loans, which are a pretty interesting innovation. Uh, so just so you're aware, flash loans allow crypto traders to perform arbitrage. So they can buy and then immediately sell an asset with different counterparties to profit from small differences in price. So you don't make a lot of money per transaction, but if you can bundle hundreds or thousands of transactions, uh, those pennies start adding up to something pretty substantial. So not too bad. Um, I was going to say, it's, it was not that long ago, maybe two months ago, that Ave was talking about or are people are talking about Ave hitting a hundred million in TVL so the fact that it's had a 10x to TVL in two months it's pretty nice and more more recently Ave has announced final testing phase for a decentralized protocol governance which they dubbed Avenomics har 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 um, so this Avenomics or Avenomics will uh, convert Aave's existing Lend Protocol tokens to Aave tokens, so they're making it a more unified, it's the Aave Protocol Aave token instead of having a different name, um, at a ratio of 100 to 1, so they'll offer unique security features, you can stake for insurance and potential liquidity, and all, all sorts of other fun stuff. Um, they're calling all this stuff uh, Aave V2, which they announced earlier in August. Version 2, or V2, which is currently undergoing smart contract audits, will reportedly enable margin trading, vote delegation, new capabilities for lenders and borrowers to swap their debt positions between different collateral tokens behind the scenes. So Aave is really doing a lot of innovation, a lot of pushing forward. They pair this with increasing the user experience. I do think they are going to be a very successful token in the long term very 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 successful token uh, they're definitely something that we should all be keeping a close close eye on so jumping over here let's talk about old cardano so blockstream ceo called it an sh blah blah coin uh, Hoskin had recently published a video in which he called on the crypto community to move away from the maximalist mentality, like Bitcoin maximalists, in favor of project collaboration. I agree with him on this. You can have a different opinion, and that's great, but I think uh, stronger together is a real thing, and that the more crypto projects are able to cooperate um, and not spend their time bickering with each other over minute details, the more time they can spend developing their protocols and pursuing further adoption. 
Uh, in addition, the IOHK CEO announced that his team will increase efforts to cooperate with other crypto projects in the future in order to create true interoperability. Bam. Perfect. Uh, as Adam Back, an early adopter of Bitcoin and founder of Blockstream, has now made clear, well, he's made clear a few times, Bitcoin will probably not be a project from which Hoskinson or, and Cardano, at least with Blockstream, will be welcomed with open arms. Some Twitter user tweeted at him, and when he responded, he lashed out and attacked not only the inventor of Cardano, but also Vitalik Buterin and Justin Sun. Uh, he said, I grant you at IOHK Charles for all his shit coining. Uh, he for sure understands hashtag Bitcoin applied crypto comp sci computer science and game theory infinitely better than the fake Toshi. Also better than Vitalik Buterin, in my opinion, who's a bit of a word salad smart bites and no wisdom tech sales guy. Uh, so that's at IH Carls, at Vitalik Buterin, at Justin Suntron, though Justin is a better marketer. So there's that. So basically, he's like, Charles knows what he's doing. Vitalik got lucky, and Justin Sun is a fake Toshi, but a better marketer. Yeah, well. Hoskinson uh, was pretty okay with whatever. Uh, he's recently published a video about the advantages of Cardano's proof of stake over Bitcoin's proof of work and explained why Cardano's proof of stake is more secure and more decentralized, reacted with humor. He explained that this probably makes him the king of the rats, and he changed his changed his uh, Twitter bio. So, I gotta love it. I mean, people, people get really angry online, and all you can really do is just lean into it and have fun. Um, so I do enjoy that. Old Charles Hoskinson, king of the rats new title all right uh that'll do it for the first four articles let's hop over here real quick and talk about binance so a little bit of an update for you in terms of binance.us it's opened its doors up to florida crypto traders Woohoo! so they uh binance.us which is the united states branch of major crypto exchange binance just announced to be making its services available to these florida residents according to an august 24th update as of the writing, Binance.us has not actually removed Florida from the list of states which its services can legally be used, um, which includes Alabama, Alaska, Connecticut, Georgia, Hawaii, Idaho, Louisiana, New York, North Carolina, Texas, Vermont, and Washington. Whew. Binance.us CEO Catherine Coley announced the expansion of the site's services on Twitter, stating Florida woman brings crypto marketplace to home state. She grew up in Orlando. What fun for her. Uh, this makes it the 38th eligible state for residents to use Binance.us since the marketplace opened account registration in the United States back in September of 2019. Uh, though its services are also available in some U.S. territories like Puerto Rico, roughly 12.3 million people over the age of 18 reside in the Sunshine State, so that increases market ability. Um, Binance.us, Binance.com, they're trying to get people to move over to those things. Eh, eh. It's a nice little thing. It makes it easier for those of you in Florida to uh, get a Binance account. Uh, they'll take your Florida ID and all that fun stuff, but it's honestly, this isn't too big of a deal if you ask me, but I don't live in Florida. It might be a big deal to you guys down there, but meh. All right, hopping over uh gnosis safe so it is a smart contract based ethereum wallet and we're going to talk about them today because they're saying they've got one more than one billion dollars worth of held crypto assets that's quite a nice so that number is based on the value of all ethereum and erc20 tokens across all contracts uh, gnosis also powers conditional tokens for predictive markets and they do run a dex so they've got a lot going on so the Gnosis Safe Twitter account shared an image that claims just over 1.08 billion in combined assets uh, that uses smart contracts to power its multi-signature wallet solution, which they offer to both individuals or companies alike. So yeah, companies can like set up like different you know numbers of people that can authorize transactions. While if you're a single owner, you can require signatures from multiple wallets, multiple devices, so you can make things really secure. It seems like it's fairly customizable. Never used it, but uh, B 
be interested to try it out if I ever get to that point that I need to uh, lock down my millions of dollars worth of crypto. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, according to the product's websites, companies such as Kyber Network, Consensus, Th Synthetics, and ENS all use Gnosis Safe. Um, oh, and just so you're aware, Consensus also funds an editorially independent decrypt, which is where this article comes from. So they've even got to do their little uh, disclaimer here. Well, it's not the only smart contract based Ethereum wallet either. Uh, there's Argent and Ethereum. Uh, they're also on the market. Neither has made like any similar claims to this. But Argent is liked by Vitalik Buterin, so there's that. Uh, Gnosis is based out of Gibraltar. It's known for more than just this multi-signature wallet. They also provide the framework for conditional tokens that can be used for prediction markets such as Omen. And they also operate the Gnosis Protocols Decentralized Exchange, which specializes in ring trades. So they've got a little bit going on. Uh, it's a good milestone and just another show of just how far this crypto bug has spread how many different little niches people are carving out and squirreling away their tokens and their coins for that magical time when joe schmo can start buying them um, easily from fiat and we get to that point or the whole industry collapses and all that fun stuff happens and the economy tanks and then crypto becomes the only thing not hyperinflating and then we all win by default so uh you know Either way, we'll be okay. So, uh, let's hop over and talk about Ripple. It's being sued by NPP Australia for alleged trademark infringement. So, the lawsuit was filed with the New South Wales Registry in the Federal Court of Australia. The plaintiff is NPP Australia Limited. In addition, it probably concerns the intellectual property and protection of the trademark, quote, pay ID. Probably. So the new payments platform, or NPP, is an industry-wide payment platform for Australia, which has already been adopted by more than 60 Australian banks. It creates a national infrastructure for fast payments within the country. Uh, NPP has already launched its own version of PayID and addressing function in February of 2018. Ripple launched, quote, its version of PayID in June of this year, offering consumers the equivalent of an email address, a unique, easy-to-read ID, and a universal payment to address the works with any service provider. And they've got about 40 partners and all this craziness going on. So basically, it's the name. Uh, official court documents describing the content of the lawsuit in detail have not yet become public. However, according to speculation about the suit so far, it seems very, very likely that the lawsuit is about the trademark pay ID. Uh, these types of courtroom disputes, they make a nice little news story as we're talking about it, but it's not actually going to do anything. Worst case scenario, Ripple's going to have to name it something else in Australia, which big companies don't like because that affects synergy and what we call things in certain places, but in terms of hurting the functionality of it, it's not going to. So eh, this will be an interesting thing to watch, just kind of work its way through the courts, uh, which will take forever all over a name. But that's business. All right. The only people who win are the lawyers. So uh, I'm going to round things off with a concerning story, and in my opinion, despite the intentions that might have been behind it. Uh, so one billion dollars in value locked is what Curve's got going for it. The founder just took 71% control of the voting power, and I think everyone in here just uh, clenched a little bit. Uh, so let me read it so you can kind of see why he did this, even though it's probably not the best. So the ethos behind DeFi has driven a move to full community governments in a democratic and transparent environment. However, as Curve recently discovered, things don't always pan out like you think. In its first governance vote, they proposed a new liquidity pool for earning Compound's comp tokens and a couple of incentives for liquidity providers. However, according to Curve, only 6.7% of its native token has been locked up for voting. So Curve voting power is calculated by multiplying the number of tokens by the lock time, with the maximum being four years. So the longer they're locked in, the greater your voting rights. These two factors have led to a couple of heavy-laden addresses holding the majority of voting rights, one of them which belongs to the founder, as we talked about. So that's where this article had me pretty 
gosh darn concerned. Only 6.7% of your tokens locked up for proof of stake and voting rights. Well, it doesn't say proof of stake, sorry, for voting rights. Um, so basically your founder maxed out everything and since he's got a bunch of tokens, he did that. Oh, great. Um, but yeah, so an apparent effort to prevent a urine finance liquidity pool heavy on CRV tokens from gaining over 50% of the voting rights because he doesn't want a competing uh, DeFi protocol to have that type of control. Curve founder Michael Aragov extended the vote lock on his huge stash of tokens to the maximum of four years to regain control. This effectively granted the founder 71%, which totally negates the entire concept of decentralized community governments. Like I've said, um, I do understand why he did this. He doesn't want a competing token to have over 50% of control, so he gave himself over 50% control. It, um, yeah, like, that's going to come back to bite you in the butt. Like, it just is. Um, it's still such a young protocol. I'm I'm worried that Curve is gonna collapse in a yam type situation because of this. It, it just it makes me nervous, um, and it's something I would stay away from personally. But uh, you do you. Like that's the point of this. You do you. So uh, let's hop on over since we're done with all the trending articles in the crypto news space today. I do appreciate all of those of you who made it this far. If you haven't subscribed why not if you have subscribed thank you you make things nice and you let me know i'm doing something right uh haters gonna hate and all that fun stuff but uh, another red day for the top 10 the only thing that's technically green is tether and we don't count that bitcoin's down two percent ethereum's down four and a half xrp's down three percent bitcoin cash down almost three percent chain link down 6.36%, Litecoin's down 4 four and a quarter percent Bitcoin SV's down by two-thirds of a percent, Crypto.com coin's down by a percent plus some, and Binance coin is down about three cents. You move on down, you got to get all the way down to number 16, Cosmos, to see anything that's not a stable coin green, sitting at 6.57% up on the day. Other than that, it is just oof. Uh, Ave is up 14% on the day. Good for them. Since we talked about them, I felt they were worth mentioning. But that'll do it for the day. Again, thank you for everything. Do your own research. Links down in the description. And I will talk to y'all eh, probably tomorrow. I don't know. Going back to work. So uh, we'll see what that day brings. Peace.